um, a very, very, very full academic year for those of us who are here at Hong Kong U. Good morning to <laughs> Crystal, who is in New York City, who is actually there presenting her film at the Harlem Film Festival. And we hope to hear how that is going in just a bit. Welcome, welcome. We also have one of the composers of the music in the film, Yiman Man Man Moy, and she is in LA, so it's really early <laughs> where she is. Uh, we also just want to remind everybody that this particular Q&A is being recorded and may be used again for teaching purposes and posted on Crystal's website. So if for any reason you want to anonymize yourself, feel free to do so. And if you have concerns afterwards, um, you have spoken a question or whatever a concern you need us to address, happy to do that. All right. Crystal and I um, had a bit of a chat during the screening, and we have decided to change the format slightly. I will introduce Crystal. You already know a fair amount about her and her family history from having watched the film, and many of you are dear friends who have known her for a long time. Several of you are students who had the opportunity to see versions of bits of this film along the way, but I wanted to do a more formal introduction. And then I have several questions that I will ask Crystal, but what we'd like to do is open things up so that as we proceed through the questions, you all should feel free to be part of the conversation. This is something that Crystal is very good at doing because she is a teacher herself. And she does, as you see, the interview work that she does, a television and a radio interviewer. So we're thinking this is an intimate enough group that you can feel free to use the chat, either to everyone or direct message to myself or Crystal. And you can even unmute and speak your question. So I will try and keep an eye on the chat as well. And I've asked Professor Marchetti to let me know if we're missing things along the way. But our hope is that this feels a little bit like a classroom, a seminar discussion of this extraordinary film. So to the more formal introduction, Crystal is, as we have seen, an award-winning filmmaker who established her career first in Hong Kong as an actor, a writer, director, and a talk show host. She won the Audience Choice Award at the 2000 Dogal Asian Film Festival for her debut film, The Mistress. As a strong women's advocate, her show, Quok Talk, broke boundaries in Hong Kong with conversations about women and sexuality. And she had she did this in several places on television in Cantonese. And then she's also done this on the radio in English. And I have to say, I found myself on the other side of Crystal's microphone in a radio studio on more than one occasion, revealing more than I intended to reveal about myself. So she definitely has a way of, of pulling things out of her interviewees. It's a delight to have the chance to be with her and all of you for tonight's continuing conversation. My introduction to Crystal came when there was a screening of the film, The Mistress, at a film festival organized by Professor Gina Marchetti. Now, Gina gave me strict instructions to keep the conversation focused on Crystal, and we will do that very shortly, but I wanna disobey Gina briefly because this event tonight is like many events that we have seen over the years where Gina brings us together as a result of her abilities, her connections, and her determination to create community around cinema. So Gina, thank you for doing that and for introducing all of us at Hong Kong U to Crystal the filmmaker. Although Crystal the student was a comparative literature postgrad at Hong Kong U. So Crystal and Man Man, both have Hong Kong U connections. Man Man did an MPhil in musicology here as well. So very exciting to see these extraordinary alumni connections here tonight. So back to Crystal. Her ability to talk 
and create with candor, compassion, and humor is, as we have all just seen, something to behold. She showed a tremendous amount of vulnerability, honesty, empathy, and I think she frees me certainly to think about how I can speak more honestly, even when it may be awkward or when I, I don't say what I intend to say or want to say. But in addition to what we saw in front of the camera tonight, this film has um, blurring the color line now, moving from the mistress to uh, blurring the color line, this film that we've seen tonight came to life under extraordinary circumstances, which I think Crystal can chat with us a little bit about. But for us to be able to see at certain points in Hong Kong, the ways in which Crystal's involvement with this city that we love is something that I think makes this film very personal for me and for all of us who love and care deeply about Hong Kong. So in addition to making this film with all of its challenges, She's concurrently been a doctoral student at the University of Hawaii at, Hawaii at Manoa. She's in performance studies, and she is a recipient of the prestigious East-West Center Scholarship Award there. And she teaches in women's gender and sexuality studies. And next spring, we'll actually institute a new course she has curated on women, gender, and sexuality in performance. There's more that we could say, but I think what I would like to do now is invite Crystal to unmute and tell us a bit, if you don't mind, Crystal, maybe just start us off since you are in New York presenting the film now at the Harlem Film Festival. And I believe the title of the festival is actually From Harlem to Hong Kong. Is that correct? So how's it going? Tell us. Thank you, Dr. Ford, and thank you, Gina, Dr. Marchetti, everybody in Hong Kong. I just first of all want to say I wish I were there. I mean, this is just, uh, well, we are. We're all here in this space because I know some people are chiming in from Berlin, from Hong Kong, from New York and LA. It's just, it's amazing to be here. So I am in New York because of this Harlem Film Festival, uh, which will be screening on Saturday. Uh, that is, what is it, today, Wednesday or Thursday? I've lost track. Um, okay. But, you know, it just uh, reminds me of how, how connected we are, because I went to see a play last night, which was the, um, an Asian American play, and it, and it also spoke to transnational conversations of what it means to be Asian in different places, or the difference between Asia and Asian American in context to America, and in context to uh, racial systems that inform of us where we place uh, wherever we are. So I just, um, yeah, I'm very looking forward to being in the Harlem Film Festival because it is a different space for me. Um, you know, I've screened it in Hawaii, which was very well received. It's, you know, it's a large, uh, predominantly Asian audience there, community. And so how is this film going to be received in the Black community? I don't know. So. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see, and I will update you if, after the screening. Thank you. Um, actually, since we're sort of on that wavelength, Elizabeth Locke Couture, the head of our gender studies program here, already has sort of begun asking questions along the same line that I wanted to pursue in terms of reactions to the film, what you wanted to say in terms of what you want to say to people in Hong Kong, as well as how you want to address a particular moment of anti-Asian anti American violence in the US. Elizabeth, would you be willing to turn on your camera and join us a little bit? And feel free to add whatever I didn't get there from your question on the chat. Well, um, first of all, fabulous job, Crystal. Um, I, I'm at home relaxing and I'm turning on my camera just because I've been staring at black Zoom boxes all semester. So I know it's nice to see a face. Um, but also I just wanna say that um, in the very, I saw very, very early outtakes of this film. So to see where it has come um, and I've actually been watching it with my husband, who is a um, historian of the US. And um, one thing we've really appreciated is the way in which you tell this family history and how you make you and your family so vulnerable. 
Um, and yet it's not just about your family and your identity as an Asian American, but it is really about the, the um, systems that structure race in the US and trying to get to the bottom of that, um, that I think makes this a really special film. And also the way in which you do interviews um, and um, the way in which you like sort of play this kind of like naive role as an interviewer and getting people to open up to you. I mean, I also just think you're an amazing teacher and we would love to have you come back someday to Hong Kong <laughs> in our program yeah. um but but anyway my my two questions were you know you did you it, it is very focused on u.s structures of race but then you mentioned this terminology which comes back to chinese terminology and so uh that makes me wonder what do you want a hong kong audience or a chinese audience to get out of this right is there also a story perhaps of Han supremacy or Sino supremacy that we can take away from this. And then the second thing that was of interest to me is the US is in a different place right now than when you started out on this film. And this is a moment of um, heightened violence, especially against Asian American women. So I also wonder what you think about the film in this moment. So those were kind of two of my questions. I have millions of questions, but I really just want to congratulate you on a job well done. And I think this is a great pedagogical tool and I'm looking forward to more conversations on this film. So thank you so much. And thank your thank family. Thank you so much. Thank your oh, family. Oh gosh. Yeah. yeah, they. I don't think they really know the extent of how much they've been exposed. Because usually when I, I have these screenings, one of my a lot of the questions <laughs> Well, not all of my family seen the whole thing. And some of them are, some of the people who watched it before are like, how does your family feel about this? So basically I'm having a big screening in San Francisco next week and we'll see what the rest of my family will say about this, you know? Um, but yeah, so thank you for all those questions. I'm gonna to try to see if I can answer as much as I can. Um, first of all, you know, Stacy, we always talk about um, transnational conversations because we need to do that. I being in this, you know, moving back to the States, um, you know, good, a good few years ago, I, I realized there's such a divide between how we like to compartmentalize Asian stories and Asian American stories, like they're not connected, which is ridiculous. You know, I don't understand why we have um, Asian American studies versus, you know, it, it's just all kind of, and then black studies, like why is African American history not connected to Asian studies? If anybody's read uh, Lisa Lowe's intimacies of four continents will know the intricate historical context to how we are all so deeply kind of connected. And, and I learned that in my process. I had to do a lot of research in order to find those connections. And also living in Hong Kong for so long, um, you don't think about racism as the way you do back in the States. And that was kind of what triggered the search to begin with. I moved back at the worst time possible when Trump was coming into our office. When I first moved, I couldn't believe it. When he won, I thought, oh my God, wait, if he wins, I'm gonna leave, you know, if I had the choice. So um, lo and behold, I stayed and this film is actually a kind of a byproduct of, of the response I'd seen, the, the racism that I'd seen, the, the deep, ugly roots of a structure of system that's so um, consequential to so many people. Uh, and for me to use my lens as a transnational Asian American, um, you know, person, I a woman, and I want to say woman because I do specifically uh, want to highlight that I did have an intentional female lens on a lot of the aspects because the whole Chinese patriarchal system thing kind of weaves into play. And I hope we can unravel that at some point in this short time together. But uh, yeah, so um, speaking to Elizabeth's I uh, idea and brilliant uh, comparison of Han supremacy and white supremacy, yes, there is definitely that parallel. In fact, uh, a couple of years ago, the last time I went back to Hong Kong, I did a presentation at the Africa Center in Jin Sazui. And we talked about racism and what it meant uh, on the level in Hong Kong. So for example, colorism, right? We know that there's a huge uh, racial a discrimination kind of a, a hierarchical system between, you know, even within the Asian communities, right? And um, 
and, and it's very problematic and we don't talk about that you know um i i'm dark skinned so i'm seen as a peasant to a kind of a fair skinned alabaster kind of privileged uh, shanghainese for example so you know there are so many things within our own culture within the chinese culture and within even asia at large so i wanted to bring that in because there is context you don't have to be from the american south to understand the story if you apply these ideas to a larger concept of uh, race, which is kind of like maybe seems like a foreign concept to Asia and Hong Kong specifically, but it's not. It's not. You know, colorism is very, very deeply rooted in our in our society in Hong Kong as well. And um, yeah, so maybe we can talk a little bit more about that as we uh, unravel some other issues in the film. But to speak to Elizabeth's other question about um, Asian American women, yes, the, oh, you know, this, uh, the crime, the violence against particularly Asian women has been close to my heart. When, when Atlanta, when the Atlanta massacre started, um, happened, it, I, we can ask Man Man too, because later on we'll talk about that. Is during our process, how did that affect us? How did that make us shape the film and address how historically this might have how, historically the image and the voices of women and how that has maybe contributed to how things play out today? Um, those are important questions because we don't think about how the past informs us today. We don't. We think it's so distant. We think okay, like in Asia, um, the South the American racial system has nothing to do with us or over here as an Asian, it's not really have anything to do with this black and white racial narrative, but it does. So, you know, I just wanted to highlight the title blurring the color line because the idea of blurring really makes us look into all these in between spaces, this transnational conversation we're having right now, uh, these in between spaces between like the Chinese position between a black and white space or the um, whatever it is within the space of the Asian communities. This is so many in between things we need to look at that intersect and connect and overlap. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna stop there because I, there's so many specific things we can tease out of the film that maybe can reference and reinforce these ideas that we're just talking about. Sounds good. And I do want to return to the question of feminist process and method in a bit. But I think since you did mention Man Man and this moment in which you thought about her involvement in the film as well, let's, can we bring Man Man? Will you, are you able to turn on your camera? Do you have a, a little coffee yet? Welcome. Oh my and gosh. Man Man, tell everybody what, what time it is in LA. Good morning. Hi, good morning. It's 5.34 a.m. right now. <laughs> you know, if Stacey <laughs> told me to get up that early, I would not have done it. I really uh, <laughs> am proud of you. And let everyone know my month's birthday oh, today. Fun. So this is a great way to start her day. Yeah, I. Um, it's actually, yeah, it's my birthday and I get to actually still celebrate my birthday when it's the May 5th in LA and May 5th in Hong Kong. So this is, this is nice. <laughs> yeah. um, And also um, before I share more, I, I use, uh, my name is Man Man. I use they, them pronouns. So appreciate you all if you can now refer to me as a third person using they, them or just use my name Man Man. I really appreciate that. Um, can I also add to that Man Man? The, the the they them idea speaks to this blurring concept. I mean, I don't want to kind of go off too much, but I think that gender and race is very intersectionally connected to what we're talking about today, because we have to look at in between spaces, we have to kind of resist binary structures and how we define um, categories. And I think so thank you for um, sharing that. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, I'm getting a lot of physiological response <laughs> having chills right now um it's and especially like speaking of what happened in the last two years and i remember when i first started writing the music and crystal you and i have a lot of moment unpacking this like living in the united states at the beginning of COVID, there was already a surge of violence towards towards asian american and then one year into that, the 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 tragedies in Atlanta happened, and and I remember 
I went, I went into the nature camping because there's nothing else we could do. And, and I was just sitting with that emotions. And as I, I identify, I do not identify as a woman. I, I am non-binary and yet the society, people see me as a woman, people perceive me as a woman and as an assigned female at birth, it's even more compound like the it's so difficult like crystal you said there's just so much and i felt really vulnerable that i couldn't even express i just feel angry i couldn't express and that's actually when i wrote the theme music for for blurring the color line so i, I recently i played that with the other collaborator um because everything in this movie, the music were all done virtually. So we never actually get to play together. Okay. So I, um, I, I, the, after the run through of that, I just sat there crying because I just, there's just so much pain that is so difficult to verbalize. And, and actually through documentary, like you actually get to experience it in a, in a way that I'm doing this because it's just, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to write off words. that idea. Uh, when you say the documentary process for yourself, I also wanted to add that, you know, from a performance studies perspective, and I don't know, Stacey, if you're probably better at maybe explaining this, um, but, you know, part of my process was kind of figuring out how a documentary performs. Um, to think about the process and how things are framed and how political it is to frame something, to know that we have the power to um, edit in or out things that we want to contain or leave out is, um, is, is, is so important to acknowledge and to question what's left out. Uh, I think a lot of the times when I look at the clips and what I wasn't able to put in there or a lot of a lot of it is talking about silent spaces, right? And that's another feminist notion that maybe we can talk about is what's not being said is actually more revealing. Um, and uh, I think we play a lot with that. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out too. Let's sort of continue on that. And since we're thinking about aesthetics and meanings of aesthetics, let's talk a little bit about the use of animation and narration in the film as well, because it seems to me that that was a very intentional way of recuperating or giving voice to moments that maybe had not been there before. And would you talk also a little bit about using Red, your daughter actually plays <laughs> Pearl, young Pearl in the film at key points. So you remember when she sat in the back of your room one time when I had a, a, a guest, you know, lecturing day at your, in, in your class, she was like a young teenager there in the back and didn't care anything, but now she's like involved. And so I'm gonna go with that one first. And it's interesting because um, yes, you know, it was convenient. She was with me and I, as she traveled with me, with me to Georgia and it struck me, you know, I didn't really realize the full extent of the layers until I really did it. Um, that to have your daughter play your grandmother as a piece of the past coming to the present was a beautiful way to connect history. Um, you know, of course, reenactment is a kind of a, a, a style in documentary that a lot of people employ, but not necessarily for the better. Sometimes they're, you know, cheesy reenactments or because of a low budget, we can't do anything else and you do that. And um, I've had critique of people thinking that maybe I should kind of maybe leave that out because it wasn't so uh, important in the in the film, but I chose to leave it in because there were those layers that you speak to. Um, I think that intergenerational embodiment is uh, a really interesting aspect that uh, comes across to me anyway. Um, and speaking to the animation, it kind of plays along with the reenactment is that with documentary, especially in a historical context, there isn't enough footage. There's not enough um, material to work with. I wasn't going to, um, you know, play all the interviews of just talking heads because that would be boring as heck. And and but what do I replace that with, right? And I was I had intentions to go back to Georgia to film more. Of course, 
COVID hit and how do you work around that? You know, my mom mentioned that we worked virtually and we had to do things um, all kind of in our different places, but I needed something visual to fill in. And so that's where the animation kicked in. And I found this brilliant young um, fresh graduate from the film department at the University of Hawaii, um, who was just, um, she, she got it because her, her mother is a, an immigrant. You know, her mother spoke to her in Chinese and, and she's this Asian American lens on, on these different spaces. And we worked with the archival photos. I think we have something really interesting is if you, if you remember the animation sequences, what we did was we took an archival photo, for example, of the store. She used that as the background and she animated on top of it. Uh, and that is kind of like a another form of embodiment, if you will, right? Because you have the archival photo of a past, and she's using modern technology to 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 draw on top of it and to make it moving, to have this movement and to connect the past again with the present through this creative form of animation. To me, was so exciting. We had these processes, and if anybody is interested in our process, we have a short clip that we put on my website um, that she shows the process. And Maman and I are also going to do one. We have, you know. Why, why is this process so important? Because it's really interesting to see how things come to be, right? From a seed idea and how it's constructed and the process of it morphing and transforming and then materializing into something that people can kind of take a hold of to reflect on something deeper. So yes, I'm, I'm just so excited about the animation. It's, it's really a fun way. And she thought, you know, you can't tell if you just look at it, but you go back to it. The background is actually this, the sepia tone of that. It's not just black and white. It's kind of a, you know, like an old photo, but she also used this textured paper that had like this crinkly old paper in the background before she put the photo and then animated on it. So again, the layers, even within that is very well thought out. And the calligraphy idea, the brush, we use brushstroke ideas, kind of like a bleeding, um, brushstroke, which also suggests the blur, you know, nothing is really hard, hard lined. And so those things are also built into that. So, you know, it was just all these processes, music, um, animation, and it is, it's just such a fun way to use these um, multi perspective ideas into it. Well, this actually leads me to the next question that I'd like both of you to explore. We've talked, we've thrown out academic terms, we've talked about um, different disciplines and interdisciplinary maneuvers, and both of you in the work that you do, you are, you're clearly committed to interdisciplinarity, but it's not always easy to bring those things together and then tell a story to people who may not understand feminist theory or gender perspectives or the ways in which the different sorts of academic literatures that you're doing, you're working with in your PhD, Crystal, how they inform the film. So could I ask both of you to reflect on what it means to be an interdisciplinary thinker and worker in this film, but also in your lives. And Manman, I was looking at your website and you are very clear about the importance of interdisciplinarity for you in your every day, as well as in the work that you do. So we have a fair number of students here who come to us from maybe disciplinary backgrounds. They're interested in moving beyond that, but it's not always so easy to think about how that translates into the sorts of creative work that you are doing, as well as how interdisciplinarity informs your day to day. Maman, may we see that? <laughs> sure. Sorry. <Thank> you. <laughs> I love I love talking with Crystal because we like always mix Cantonese and English. <laughs> you when you have a chance, feel free, to, feel free to type your link to your website into the chat group once you sure. Once okay. you. <laughs> Yeah, we'll all both do that. Thank you. Um, it's it's interesting that you asked this question because I had I was just processing. Um, so by the way, other than uh, other than graduating with an MPhil in musicology, I was also an undergrad in Hong Kong U, and I majored in music and minor in com com comparative literature. So I spent a decent amount of time um, in in the comlit department too. 
And there yeah. was one thing that really resonate with me. Wow, it's been over 10 years ago since I graduated, but I still remember this. One of the biggest takeaway for me um, was <laughs> the, the concept of looking at everything is connected and everything could be understand or interpret as text. Because I remember maybe with, with Dr. Like with, 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 with Gina, and um, sorry, when I, this is what happened when I'm processing so much, it's hard to come through, which is also the answer to why, why it's so important for me to be working as an interdisciplinary artist, because I don't think in one way, I'm, I don't think in a linear way. I, I, um, I'm also a neurodivergence, meaning in some so for example, when I'm thinking of a memory, I can smell, I can taste, I can see vivid images, I can hear sound, music. Um, even just now I'm thinking about my memories, like back in Hong Kong U, I can see the main building. That's when we, we were still in the main building and music department was still in the Hong Kong Ying building. And, and I'm still remembering sitting in one of the room when that moment, um, either Dr. Jern or Dr. Machetti explaining to us the meaning of text suddenly just opened up the world for me because a piece of music, um, a scene in the movie, when in, in the movie people just so, focus so much about the dialogue, wait, wait a second, there's editing, like Crystal said, how you edit a scene together, that's a choice of language, that's a narrative. And then the angle, the, the set, like the animation, how the set is being viewed is, is it's something that's telling you about. And, and I, I actually grew up with um, a situation of mutism, meaning that majority of my childhood, I couldn't speak. Um, I could only speak with uh, really close family members. And so in some ways, like, I love being able to express in different ways. And I only discovered that a couple of years ago. And, and I asked myself too, why am I doing so much different Discipline, disciplinary things, and but then actually our life doesn't work in compartmentalized way. <laughs> Might be nice if it did, but no, <laughs> no, yeah, it doesn't. Crystal, you want to? And then people who have these kind of binary and linear ways of thinking just write it off that you know we're all over the place or something, you know, and, and just kind of. Yeah, throwing some excuse that right. it's, it's a female I still, thing or, you know. Yeah, I still hear that Cantonese saying like of like, uh, like you have a lot of knife, but none of them are sharp. Um, That's funny you but, say that because my dad used to tell me to always <laughs> only sharpen one knife at a time, but I would always re, re, rebuttal and say that I my my knife i have a swiss army knife you know i have many different <laughs> tools that i sharpen at the same time i can't just have one knife <laughs> so yep. thank you for that knife metaphor <laughs> yeah um yeah say no go you i'd like you to talk a little bit about interdisciplinarity and i actually see we have a student question so jasmine yes, i'm gonna ask you I to get that, ready too to show yourself in just a bit. But um, before we do that, Crystal, this may yeah. a moment for you to think about feminist process because that is interdisciplinary work as well. So absolutely, does that make sense to sort of segue yeah. there? Yeah, and also I just wanna take this time to encourage anybody to make comments and questions in the chat because this is that space where we can do that and we can multitask, right? So, and we can go all over the place. This is a fluid space. And that speaks to kind of the feminist methods that I, I like. And, you know, I, I think they're all terms, you know, interdisciplinary, intersectional, we can call it whatever we want. It's, it's, it's really, for me, I like the word blur. I like to dumb it down because it's like, sometimes we get caught up in jargons um, in the academic space of what it means to be multi, um, disciplinary and you know to have these uh, different spaces of thinking um, and yes um, we we need to kind of have vocabulary for it 
but sometimes you don't have that and it's hard to articulate but it's like like my mom says wow you know how memory can have a, a, a smell to it or a taste or a sound to it you know these are all brilliant ways of kind of um deconstructing okay no that's just another fancy academic term you know <laughs> but it is we're trying to strip everything away to rebuild how we look at things because we don't realize how much we've been sucked into a way of thinking and a way of learning that is informed by a very kind of dominant way of power structure we don't realize this and i think this applies to the films um addressing of white supremacy, but also to a larger idea of what it means to learn. For me, um, like uh, Maman said, you know, questioning what text is, um, text is in many forms, you know, how does a documentary perform? It goes back to that idea. Can a documentary serve as text? I'm arguing for that. I'm using this as my dissertation in my uh, PhD program at the University of Hawaii. And, you know, um, it, it's hard to try to dismantle things that have held power for so long. Why is it in the university system? It's all run by old white men. I'm sorry, but it's been like the historical truth for so long um, in many countries that we don't challenge these power structures. And so from a feminist perspective, as you speak, to gives me the tools to and the space and the power to question these power structures like why why should we think that that professor has has a more intelligent um idea of of thinking just because he's a, an old white man and i'm sorry i don't mean to offend anyone but um you know it's just a fun space to be able to do that um but going back to the for me this interdisciplinary idea I like the word entanglement. Uh, one of my superstars in feminist studies, if anybody's really into that, is Anna Singh. She wrote this book called Mushroom. And I, I think I showed it, shared it to my mom too. I mean, I just love talking about the, that book, um, the mushroom book. <laughs> because if you apply the idea um, that is so abstract that you know how to take that concept into anything you do, it opens up so much more. So I'm going to bring it back to music, and I'm sorry I'm all over the place, but we talk about these um, structures. Like when we're thinking about music, I remember I was doing my oral, my my um, comps, um, and I, I texted Man Man because I was thinking about how do I put music into my um, uh, my paper, and uh, Man Man asked me a question because I, I was thinking about the term. What was it? Poly polyphonic music, right? See, I forgot uh, the name. The, the music that we use is polymeter, uh, polyrhythm. Polyrhythm, thank you. So I was wondering, you know, poly, again, going back to this feminist method of having multiple layers of seeing things. So on the music level, how do we, what, it, what is polyrhythm and how does that apply to my um, approach to, to the ideas of, of weaving in memory and history and women's voices and Chinese, um, confusion values and all these things. So all these different sounds, how does that come together to play in my film? Um, and she said, well, Mama, she said, do you remember? She says, do you, do you know, have you ever heard how frogs speak to each other? And it was so um, poignant because I lived in Sheko um, before and to walk to my house, I would pass these places where every year at a certain time of the year, we had these bullfrogs right around my jungle and they would croak so loud that people literally thought there were cows living outside my backyard, but there were frogs and they croak and my mom's telling me, and maybe you can help me elaborate a little bit on this, is that they all sing seemingly discordantly because they have their own rhythm, but at some point it becomes like a symphony of unison. And it was so brilliant that that's how I see how these seemingly discordant sounds come together to play out something so beautifully um, synchronous. Is that right, Maman? Maybe you'd like to elaborate on that. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, thank you for reminding me that conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yes, I used a lot of uh, polyrhythm uh, in the music that I, I wrote for blurring the color lines. And so the way that I describe, because I also, I grew up in um, 
uh, Daibo and Fanlang, and I used to live in Muiwo, so I get to hear. I still remember that I hear the frogs, and and so it's interesting that this is also white supremacy at play in the way that we interact and understand music, or just like we majority of the music that we hear in everyday life or celebrate or uplift it are very straightforward um but again our everyday life don't work in the same straightforward rhythm like four four if i use the musical terms and like if you listen to the frog like our because we live in a society that kind of forces us to conform to to get in line sometimes we our brains try to find that okay what is it what is it um like can i just give me something simple but then actually if you step back and listen to the full picture like even though sometimes like this one may be going in three and the other going in two like maybe at the time it starts to like they're fighting with each other but actually if you listen to them together they are they are in harmony it's just not in the steady way like they, they're steady it's just they're not in unison and to me diversity and harmony doesn't necessarily mean unison but it's finding the space to move together and everybody, every, every individual can be at their own pace and stay to their truth. And so I think, yeah, that's why I like, I love polyrhythm because I myself live in a very different rhythm all my life. And, and then I've been uh, exposed and sort of told, told that you got to fall in line. You got to get in line. It's your fault if you don't. But no, actually, that's not true. Um, and actually, a lot of music, like from like African culture, or I'm I'm in love with Balinese music. I used to play in the University of Gamelan in Hong Kong U, and also went to Bali to study. And their music, it's all about that. It's all about interconnection. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so <laughs> thank you. Mom, it's been terrific to have you join us. Very much appreciated. All right, I do, I'm looking at the clock and we're gonna go until about 9.15, but we have um, a couple of student questions. So first, Jasmine, will you be willing to turn on your camera and join us? And then Laura, after that. Hi, Welcome, Professor Jasmine. Ford. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Mun Mun. Um, so like my question was essentially based on like a conversation we had in class in um, actually um, last semester in uh, Professor Ford class. Um, so essentially my question, and as you mentioned before, how actually what isn't said or what isn't shown is actually more revealing than, you know, what is. I'm curious like about like the interviews that you had to leave out or were there like any people who refused to be interviews, uh, interviewed, sorry. So like, um, I guess for some people um, in last semester, uh, I actually talked to you about how there's this sort of like idea of needing to be in solidarity with people of your own race. So for example, it's this idea of protecting your own people in the sense so that you won't, that will make it very hard for you to swallow any sort of harsh reality against yourself. So for example, like um, I come from my, uh, my Chinese family and every once in a while, of course, you hear those racist comments, right? Hot, hot, yeah. Or, or like any sort of colorism. And like um, in Hong Kong, when we talk about like, I'm in between two worlds as well. My dad's from Hong Kong, whereas my mom's from Vietnam. So I'm like an ethnic minority, but not an ethnic minority at the same time. But then even within the ethnic minority community, there's also this sort of hierarchy where, because for Vietnamese, we look more Chinese compared to let's say um, people from Pakistan, Indians, although I grew up with them in school. So I was wondering like, um, did you have to like leave any interviews out? Because I think I recall you mentioning when you, uh, last semester that there was an interview that you actually had to leave out because what they didn't agree to be shown, like to, to have their interview shown in the documentary. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And thank you for sharing your perspective because context is everything, right? It's how we're shaped and how we see things. And um, so, yes, I'm glad you remembered that. Um, there was a critical place, and I'm, I don't know if you remember that moment. It was like two days before we had to lock picture. And I had a very critical scene where I interviewed uh, an aunt of mine, a relative, uh, who had a crucial kind of turning point of where it exposes how I discovered that I did have um, African-American relatives because she married a black man from Mississippi. 
And uh, her points that I interviewed, she 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 says, um, sorry, I, I don't feel comfortable with this. Uh, for whatever reason it is, you know, she just had decided to pull back. And I had to last minute cut out her parts. And I was thinking, shoot, how am I going to connect the stories when I have this vital part that I can't use? So um, these are the challenges, I guess, um, filmmakers or storytellers have to make with the conditions of of consent um and you know how do you weave stories together based on what you have and uh to your question of what was left out oh so many so many things you know my, my original film title was called unruly chinese women i really wanted to focus on the the women's stories and my mom can remember that you know i had a version where it was really more about the memories and playing off of that theme and and why these why and how these women defied the structures that try to control them and um and so again you know things get shaped by larger powers around us but i really did um i have a a big you know i'm, I'm very i have a very kind of soft spot for for these stories of intimate histories i think intimate histories and i try to use a little bit in the film but there's a lot more that i couldn't use Women's stories are so often, um, you know, overshadowed by the way men tell stories and throughout history, right? And so they think we we come to think that stories from the bedroom or stories from um, spaces like sneaking out or dating are insignificant, insignificant spaces. Why? You know, to me, if you remember that scene of my grandmother sneaking out. You know, I thought that was a really important and revealing point about racial uh, structures because she snuck out with a white boy at her black neighbor's house, and I thought, wow, you know, what does that say about these these structures we're um, we're built around? And um, so, yes, intimate stories are the way to go, I think, because they reveal a lot more. And speaking to Stacy's earlier introduction of the teasing out people's private stories they're important you know sexuality is such a taboo topic still even in the states you know surprisingly well maybe not surprisingly um but why are we so uncomfortable with topics around our body um and why does it take us to be looked at as marginal people to be able to open up space for that you know, it, it's not something that should be kind of pushed aside. It, it's something that we all uh, deal with. Um, so anyway, yeah, if I had a choice to bring everything, anything back in, I would definitely kind of push on the, the sexuality button, <laughs> which I've always done, uh, because it's an important connection to a, a deeper understanding of who we are and a connection to things around us. So yeah, thank you for that question, Jasmine. And speaking of connections, I would encourage everybody to see The Mistress. And we should talk about, is it possible to see The Mistress? It's not an easy film to get, but you can definitely see important connections between that film and where you end up going here. And it's mm -hmm. also fascinating to see that so many of these issues are issues that we have literally been talking about for decades in many places. And yet here we are. It's, um, progress is slow, voices that have been marginalized. There are many reasons why things have not changed, but there's also a lot of fatigue with feminism, with challenging you know, existing power structures as well. So I think a film like this is really important because it engages everybody regardless of, I think, where they are, because it's a very personal story and one can start with the personal. Um, Laura Meek actually, and apologies to Laura, Laura is a colleague and not a student, and because of the COVID cave that I've been living in, I have not actually been able to chat with Laura, but she's not able to unmute herself right now, so I'm going to ask her question for her, and again, thanks for the question, Laura. She says, thank you for this brilliant and powerful film sharing. I'm wondering if in making this film, you also had a critique of racial capitalism in mind, given how much of the material addressed class inequalities and their intersections with white supremacy and patriarchy. Thank you. Wow, okay, that's a big one. You know, I, I, think, I think the world capitalizes off of anything that's kind of, um, 
contentious and uh you know you know this speaks to, to gendered spaces and racial spaces and you look at the media you look at the media and how we get misinformed by the way things are framed um and 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 reinforcing certain maybe ideas about people so yes um i haven't thought directly about that but in in thinking back about this process there is so much um you know i'm going to draw it back to my and i discussion we had a lot to discuss around what it meant this anti-black racism what does it mean from a chinese perspective and we bring it back to really trying to understand what white supremacy is and i think addressing the hong kong and asian audience i don't think we we don't we don't think about white supremacy because we don't think it has anything to do with our lives and yet it is a concept that if you feel it it applies to so much about power structures that i mentioned before um, i remember mama do you want to share how you talked about um it's not the shark i want to let you finish that one that's <laughs> I was an important thinking, analogy yeah i was just thinking about a quote i came across this quote i'm sorry i forgot who wrote this um oh. This person's wrote, um, white supremacy is not the shark, it's the water. And isn't that and like a haunting idea? It it's surrounding us. And I grew up born and raised in Hong Kong. I used to be one of those people. And to to think that even after I moved to the US for a while, I thought that I I don't have a place to speak about like the trauma of uh racial violence and and then I suddenly just dawned on me, oh gosh, I grew up in a British colony. And, and of course, like every single bit of how Hong Kong is being built, structured, the economy and the class, like it's, it's, it's there. How we think, even I study music, like just even look at how the journey of me studying music or just look around, that people preferences, it's it's everywhere. White right, right supremacy is everywhere. And, and I want to just sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. Go ahead, go ahead. No. Just to kind of reemphasize that um, white supremacy is not about a targeting white people. It's it's a system, right? We're not we're not talking about oh white people being like super whatever. It's the system of basing everything standard around. The white as center and i think to apply that to the film and to apply it to bigger ideas of intersectionality and interdisciplinary and um, feminist ideas is that sometimes you have to create well this is what how white supremacy works is you have to create a defining border which by othering people you reinforce that white center right whatever it is that power structure is in the middle we can talk about china in context of things it's the same thing that applies so if you're not part of that center everything else is marginal and so everyone's striving to be inside because then that's that privileged space of of where you have access to power and privilege and everyone, that's why the Asians, going back to, you know, I think the idea of model minority is not so familiar in the Asian um, societies, but in the US, it, it's a big deal. It's like, oh, so you Asians played that game. You trying to move your way up by pretending you're like more closer to the white side of the color line um, than the black side. And, and so um, these all play to that idea um, of this white power that's so white supremacist power, sorry, that that really defines the standard that we don't question. Right. And yeah, and actually, like, oh, I, I just I say, go, go ahead quickly. I just that that segues nicely into Richard's question, but finish, please, Man Man. Go. Um, I was gonna say, this question also tied into the last question that I thought of a scene in the early on of the documentary that actually Crystal, you and I had like a struggle with that was like the those you were interviewing a Chinese older Chinese man on the bus and he made a comment that it's uh, blatant anti blackness and and then someone asked you to took that scene out because to protect this Chinese man and protect the image of Chinese, but then like you felt the importance of keeping that scene in. So what we ended up doing was we 
we blur the like audio uh, part that like you can get the the hints of that but then you don't actually hear the rest of it to protect this person so that it doesn't be taken out of context but then at the same time we recognize the importance of including that because like it's not the, this man's fault to be like yes he caused harm by saying that but it's not his fault because how do we get there because of years of intergenerational trauma of just to survive to assimilate and like why do asian american assimilate because it's survival in immigrants and surviving in foreign country and white has power white supremacists maintaining the status quo and to pit like people of color against each other and mm -hmm. to maintain that status quo but yeah. now we actually turning the lens i hey, hate wait a second why do we have to uplift this power in the center why can't we do break that down exactly so that's all yeah, yeah. thank you Indeed. And actually, after all of this, it makes me want to go back and watch the film and listen again in light of all of, you know, that we've heard tonight. Richard, in some respects, takes us back to, I'm looking at time, this is probably our last question, but Richard takes us back to Professor Lacouture's question early on. She talked about how much things have changed in the U.S. even since you finished this film. So. Richard, would you like to, we, we don't have a camera on Richard, but he's willing to unmute and ask his question audially. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Manman, for your amazing discussion. It's really thought provoking. But I'd also like to ask that, uh, as, as, as Dr. Ford said, with recent events and the rise in violence towards Asian Americans, there are there is some media um, media's conflicting narratives, such as you know, on the one side, we talk about shared suffering between Black Americans and Chinese Americans, but at the same time, there's controversy with Black on Chinese violence and vice versa. So my question would be, what would change if you were to refilm this today? Um, do you think that the interviewee's answers would, you know, stay the same, similar, or would it change quite radically? And how might you have done things differently if you were to refilm now? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Um, and thank you for your observations and paralleling the kind of concept that applies to the Chinese. It's a, it's a crazy time on both sides, um, very sensitive. Basically here, you can't say anything, right? Um, and I think that applies over in Hong Kong too. Um, you know, there's always something a filmmaker would wanna change. There's no, there's no perfect, um, version, I think, um, but to speak to the changes and how that's affected, or maybe maybe people might have different um, concepts. I think the older generation that I had interviewed, I don't think they would honestly ever change the way they view things, um, and that's kind of part of displaying that perspective because intergenerational conversations are important. Um, the difference in the way we see things and the the ability to um, address certain issues that are changing and shifting and how we need to uh, um, look at um, uh, issues like racism. But maybe I would have uh, incorporated some younger gen more younger generation perspective because that's where you see the difference. I think there is movement um, from the younger generation in terms of how we we see things um, more kind of um, multi perspective um, but then again, okay, I'm just, I know we don't have that much time, but I also wanted to throw in one more feminist idea is this concept of situated knowledge. Because um, Stacy, you, you also mentioned before that you remember one of the animation filmmakers, uh, Anne-Marie Flemings, she was one of the story consultants for me and she has some beautiful films. If you do, please check it out. I don't know if Gina, you can write her um, films out in the chat, but um, as, as a consultant, she looked at it and she wasn't consulting on the animation, she was consulting on the story. And she asked me, what's, what's that girl looking at? You know, I always had these images, the animation of a girl looking out the window uh, because, and also there was the, re re the reenactment of my daughter looking out the window. There is this idea of a person looking out of a framed window and it's, it's, it's partial perspective, right? And in, in feminist studies, we talk about the lack of perspective, but that partialness is what's 
your perspective and how important that is to recognize that partial perspective in anything we do that what i see out that window is not what you see out your window and maybe i'm looking at this house from a side window a side entrance into this house that most people see from the front entrance and that kind of shifting is so important and so you know i guess speaking to richard's question about you know what i would do differently is maybe how how do we get these different angles in these different lenses these different views and um and and different framing uh, you know those are all really important questions that can always shift and change and 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 open up um, new ways of looking at racism so yeah i think um there are lots of things that i would like to play with and hopefully i have more room to play with that in future projects that are kind of um inspired by all this digging thank you and thank you to gina and georgina for putting links in the film that crystal just mentioned was Anne marie fleming's the magical life of long tuck sam and we will be teaching that film actually next year in the history department along with Crystal Stone and other films as well. We do have one more question and um, Laura asked it, but I've also had a couple of other direct messages. Where can people buy the film? Although I think hopefully what we've done tonight is stirred some interest in getting people to push their networks for more for you know, a larger public venue, a screening here in Hong Kong when Crystal can join us. But if people do want to use the film for teaching, what do they do, Crystal? I have no idea. <laughs> I, like, you know, I'm so, who will be thanking in a minute, right? <laughs> are there any sales agents out there? <laughs> I know the education distribution system is a whole other thing I haven't really explored yet. I'm just starting on the film festival route, so it's just the beginning. Um, you know, people who know Daniel Wu uh, Min Do, he is my one of my producers, and he's been brilliant in connecting me with some people, um, including our, my other executive producers, Kamal Bell and Lisa Ling. Uh, so it's I'm very fortunate to have the support, but where it gets taken and to be seen is yet to be seen. I hope that people recognize the significance of a film like this that does disrupt these kind of dominant narratives and to open up dialogue on very um, un untold histories about the. No, no. Something. Come so, back. Hey, you're um, back. We lost you briefly. Oh, we, really? Oh, we, we I guess, lost you. Yeah. We hope there was more interest in people who are interested in untold histories, and then we yes, lost yes. you. We're back. Okay. Well, that's a sign. That's a sign that something's kind of, you know, we need to wrap up. But yes, yeah, so um, I think the best thing to do is if people can go on my website, um, blurringthecolorline.com and sign up for our newsletter. We'll hope to be, um, you know, you can contact us that way. And I'm really working hard on trying to get more visibility and critical discussions around the, uh, the issues addressed in the film and larger because this applies to many things on a global scale. And race relations is not going to go away in the near future. If anything, it's getting more complex complex and and um it's it's unfortunate but we are fortunate to have spaces like this that allow us these uh opportunities to talk about it so thank you so much stacy and gina and, and everyone from hong kong and thank you for being willing to share this film at this point when um honestly everybody who's listening we were able to show this film at exceedingly low prices, thanks to Crystal and her, her generosity. So we are we are incredibly grateful to Crystal, to Man Man. And again, I wanna reiterate the thank yous that Gina has already shared one more time. Thank you to our co-organizers, the Faculty of Arts Committee on Gender Equality and Diversity, the Department of Comparative Literature Center for the Study of Globalization and Cultures, our co-sponsors, the Gender Studies Program in the School of Humanities and the Women's Studies Research Center, and Tiffany Shan, Lorraine Lau, and the amazing Georgina Challen, who has to keep track of more than I even want to think about. And of course, to Gina Marchetti, who brought us all together originally. So thank you to everybody. Um, sleep well or have a good day or lunch or wherever and we will follow up if we can if there's more news about other screenings of the film and please be in touch um, if you want to know more about any of the sponsoring bodies and crystal i'm sure crystal and Munman, you'd be okay if people reach out to oh, you please please you want to talk yeah all right 
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank Appreciate you. everybody being here. Thank Terrific. you. Bye-bye.